have them posted on the Okay, and we do have a set of meeting norms. Um, these norms are really just about us being civil to each other. We like, you know, we want us to be kind to each other. Um, so we do ask that you commit to learning. We do really encourage you to ask questions so you understand um, the, the projects and, and the information that's being conveyed instead of um, speculating on what the meaning is behind things. We also ask that when you are speaking over the phone or even through the computer, if you can move to a quiet place, we encourage you to do that. I know that's not always easy to do that, but um, if you can, we would like you to do that so we can hear you a little bit better. Um, we also would like you to remember the rights and dignities of other people. So create, critique ideas, not people, and be thoughtful about your language to be inclusive. And I'm seeing that the poll wasn't functioning, so it should be functioning now. Okay, sorry, I apologize. This is one of the worst meetings I've been in in terms of a technology fumble. Um, so thank you for bearing with me. So getting into what the American Rescue Plan is, um, actually, since we have John on the line, if you don't mind just doing a quick overview, and again, this, we don't need to necessarily go into a, a thorough overview like we did the first night, but if you don't mind touching on all of this. Sure, thanks, Heather. Um, so the American Rescue Plan was passed by Congress last year and doled out uh, quite a bit of funding to local governments. Uh, and they were doled out based on uh, the proportion of what you would have gotten uh, had that amount of money been filtered through the Community Development Block Grant Program. And so for the city of Ann Arbor, that equaled $24.2 million. And there are fairly detailed federal regulations that stipulate how these funds can be spent. Thank you. And these are the basic buckets of what it can be spent on. So negative impacts um, of COVID-19, premium pay for eligible workers, government service um, services to the extent and loss of revenue and investment. And again, I'm still sorry that this is cut off here. Um, so that's investment in infrastructure. And this is uh, kind of the key information about these funds. So the period it covers is from March through 2021 through to December 2024. Um, and costs can be incurred by December 31st, 2024, but it must be expended by 2026. So that's, that's one of the key factors that really went into the decision-making process about the projects that um, we're considering right now is that they must be done by 2026. Uh, some of the prohibited uses are pension contributions and debt payments um, may not be used as a federal match um, there are significant reporting requirements and ARPA funds are temporary in nature. So typically they would not be used for creating new programs that require an ongoing revenue source. Okay, I ended the poll. Thank you for those who um, provided your answers. So how were the projects identified? So that, um, you know, going from the criteria that was just mentioned, so the federal guidelines, um, and then uh, reviewing prior council directions, so projects that were already on deck and um, uh, projects that um, typically had a lot of process behind it. Um, so engagement that went into projects that are showing up and the plans that have been adopted already. And then of course, all the projects that could be spent down before the 2026 deadline. And so with that, oops, going again, I'm so sorry about this. So that gets us to our projects. I see that Chief Cox is here as an attendee. Perhaps he can be promoted to be a panelist. Let me get him in here. Welcome, Chief Cox. And I see that we have Councilor Griswold in as one of the attendees as well. 
All right, Chief Cox, if you don't mind um, going over just a quick view of the projects. Thank you very much. Yes, so, uh, you know, the, the quick overview I have is this is about the Community Law Enforcement and Public Safety Data Platform, uh, where we are looking to build public trust, um, obviously through community police, policing, through uh, appropriate data collection, uh, to hopefully reduce human biases, support quality services that we provide the public, and to improve on our critical decision making uh, and, and make sure that we're in line with public sentiment and good practice uh, in general. Um, you know, when we talk, talk about community policing, this, the core to that is building good relations but, um, by providing public input, partnership, education, and an internal and external communications with, with the public. We need to share our information and data about what we do and how we do it, and then look for opportunities to improve. Uh, unfortunately, law enforcement uh, uh, data mechanisms that are, have existed have been around a long time and haven't been improved very, very much. And so we need to reframe uh, you know, how we look at what we do uh, to look for impacts and outcomes that will improve at least the, the sentiment with the public and more importantly, to help us build trust with the community by being more accountable and transparent in what we do and how we do it. Uh, um, this project will hopefully uh, provide the, the necessary measures for us to be able to do that uh, at a cost of about a, a million two hundred forty-four thousand seven hundred forty-five dollars. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then unarmed response. There we go. Hi everybody, I'll just talk briefly about our unarmed response program. Uh, as many of you know, there was a report that went to council uh, at the end of last year that, um, you know, our intention was really just to level set for a conversation we want to have in 2022 with uh, stakeholders and subject matter experts and with the community about what exactly this program is going to look like. And so uh, the broad intention here, uh, as directed by the city council, is to have uh, the city develop a program that will divert armed officers from responding to non-criminal and non-violent calls for service and with the intention of utilizing medical professionals, social workers, and other human services professionals that might be better suited to meeting those individual situational needs. And so what we're really asking uh, for from the public right now is, you know, we have proposed using some of this ARP funding, $2 million of it, as startup funding for this program. We don't have a detailed proposal right now because we're going to be engaging in a very deliberate uh, community engagement process to help build that program. And we think it's really important that uh, that, that process occur first as we're building that program out. But what we do know is we are going to need money to start it. You know, it, it may take the acquisition of, you know, vehicles and equipment. It, it may take partnerships with vendors. It's certainly going to take uh, the cost of staff. And so uh, we set aside uh, in our initial recommendation to council, we set aside $2 million of ARP funds to help us um, put together seed money for this program. And what we're asking for from the public is, uh, is it appropriate for us to be doing that? Do you want us to prioritize the ARP funding for this type of a program? So uh, that is why it is here. And, and that's the feedback we're looking for. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, then I'm gonna stop sharing for now and then just open it up to questions. And I'm gonna start with, I see that we have a number of questions in the Q&A feature. So I'm gonna start going down and some suggestions about the technology issues. So thank you for that, I really appreciate that. And again, I'm sorry for all this fumbling. Um, let's see, how were the projected costs of each program estimated? Will there be more detail on the expenses uh, that were included? Will there be opportunity for feedback on those estimates before city council must decide which to support? Well, I can start and talk about the unarmed response. Um, the, the truth of the matter is that 
uh, since we haven't developed a specific pro program proposal yet, we don't have a set cost for what that program is going to cost. Uh, so our intention is to use the ARP funds as seed money, but it's also true that we're going to have to program costs into the general fund as well. So I wouldn't look at this and say, the city is only intending to spend $2 million on unarmed response. I would look at this and say, the city wants to use $2 million as part of startup funding uh, with full acknowledgement that, uh, you know, the scope and cost of this program is gonna come uh, after, uh, again, after community engagement, after the program is developed uh, and that the city council and, and the city, I think are committed to, to fully funding an effective program moving forward. Thank you. All right, who will be overseeing the management and coordination of the unarmed response? So uh, the unarmed response program is, uh, I think, envisioned to be a city program, but what the governance structure looks like and you know what kind of community partners or vendors are involved in it, I think is still very much up in the air. Uh, again, because we wanna have a very deliberate conversation with the community about uh, the form and structure of this program and what it is going to look like. So, uh, you know, we're intentionally not being prescriptive about it right now because it, this really is, you know, we just, we want to make sure that we're being inclusive and that, uh, you know, we're seeking advice from the community, from subject matter experts, from potential partners in the community and really centering those voices as the uh, project proposal comes together. Yeah. And then I see a hand is raised. So I'm going to move over to that and then I'll come back to some of the written Q&A. So Glenn, you should be able to talk. This is Glenn Nelson. And can you hear me? Mm -hmm. um, with regard to public safety data, I strongly recommend a survey that would provide information on who people turn to for help in a crisis or a highly stressful situation, why they make these choices and how these choices evolve over time. A citizens group I help lead, Citizens for Mental Health and Public Safety, provided the framework for such survey to city council members and a small number of city administrators, including John, on December 29th. I will send this to Chief Cox and his deputies. In brief, it includes a survey of households most likely to be in need of emergency services and a second survey of leaders of organizations who are most likely to be well informed on people's attitudes towards the use of emergency response. With regard to the unarmed response program, I'm going to limit myself to three points rather than to try to say everything I think should be said. First, I urge you to strengthen existing organizations that provide a response by unarmed people rather than create new organizations. We are fortunate to have many dedicated people in service organizations doing this work, but with too few resources. Second, and closely related to the above, please do not create yet another telephone number for people in crisis or in great stress. For crisis situations, we already have 911-734-544-3050, and we'll soon have 988 and 844 four, four, six, four, two, two, five. And for high stress situations falling short of an emergency, we have 734-994-2911 and 734-544-3050 and 211 and 888-733-7753. I can tell you what these are if you want, but the point is we have a lot of telephone numbers. What we need is for this program to help people in crisis or stress know who to call and navigate their way through the system. 
This will require cooperation and collaboration with county officials. Third and finally, uh, please give special attention to children, young people, and families with children and young people. The future of children and young people in their moments of trouble depend heavily on our desire and ability to guide them into helpful therapeutic channels rather than put them in the juvenile justice system. We are particularly weak in this regard in our community. <clears throat> A recent study titled Mental Health Services in Washtenaw County by the well-regarded Center for Health and Research Transformation concluded the most substantial persistent gaps in behavioral health services are in services for youth, including substance use and harm reduction services, residential services, and targeted programming for at-risk subpopulations. Thank you for this opportunity to uh, offer my view. Thank you. And then we'll go to the next hand raised and then I'll go back to the Q&A. So Donald, you should be able to talk. Hi, uh, Donnell Weich here, a resident of Fourth Ward, uh, just calling in in support of unarmed response. And while I appreciate the last caller's uh, listing of all the numbers which are available in our community, I would like to point out uh, there is a recent article in Criminology uh, Journal that just hit this week uh, that speaks to uh, the concerns of African Americans, particularly Blacks. Uh, as it relates to law enforcement, that um, Black residents who are in crisis, 45% uh, of the time prefer to be criminalized or the victims of crime than to interact with law enforcement. And if the only means available to uh, those of us in the community who identify as Black and may have concerns with local law enforcement relies on 911, then we are as a community deciding to exclude a portion of our community. And I think African-Americans in the city of Ann Arbor make up some 7%. Uh, so I would like to uh, strongly encourage, uh, as we did in the Coalition for Reimagining Our Safeties Plan, a separate number for unarmed response in the city of Ann Arbor. Uh, that does not mean that 911 cannot dispatch to that separate number. But I think in order for us to serve our community and to serve all of our community, we need to have alternatives. Uh, so I would like to uh, just offer that to you and I'll uh, send you a link to the article, uh, Mr. Fournier, so you can take a look at it and uh, pull up that information. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention uh, briefly was just around uh, the funding sources. So some city staff have discussed aspects of the Crows plan that we or yeah that we've submitted and have emphasized uh, a barrier to like a separate number being the costs and the expense. Um, and so I wonder, given the twenty four million dollar allocation with the ARPA funds uh, and the city's commitment to unarmed response, will cost uh, be prioritized? as we develop this program over the care of the community? So that, that would be a question. Sure, thanks, Donnell, I appreciate that. So uh, our objective is to create a high quality program. Uh, as stewards of public money, we are cost restricted in everything that we do. So at some point there is going to be a limit that cost imposes on this program, just as, uh, just as exists with every single program that we run in the city. Uh, but our intention is to create a quality program. Um, and uh, I, I just want to point out that the, some of the discussion in the report wasn't, you know, uh, the idea of creating a alternative number for people to call, uh, you know, either instead of 911 or in addition to 911 is, is one thing. The idea of creating a separate stand up uh, 
you know, dispatch center, a 911-like dispatch center, that is very cost prohibitive. So there, there are a lot of things that can be explored, uh, uh, a lot, you know, a lot of different arrangements that can be explored uh, for an alternative phone number that uh, are not a, uh, you know, very expensive, very logistically difficult separate dispatch center that is a 911-like dispatch center that can still be very helpful and useful for an unarmed response program. And I just think that's, uh, that's important to point out as, as we discuss uh, what this program might look like in the future. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, then we have um, uh, a couple of process questions that I wanted to address. One of the questions is, will this session be recorded and posted online? Yes, it is being recorded currently and it will be posted online on the project website. Um, the next question is, if Chief Cox is here, do we also have a panelist from ICPOC? So I'm wondering if maybe um, anyone from the panel wants to comment on the role of ICPOC? Sure, so uh, that's a great question. And so the purpose of this hearing is to talk about uh, ARP funding, right? And so we wanna know from people generally, should we be putting a chunk of this money toward an unarmed response program? We are going to be doing a whole separate community engagement process around what that unarmed response program looks like. And we will definitely be inviting ICPOC to, uh, to partner in that program. Uh, and to be involved in the drafting of that program. So uh, in terms of uh, this public hearing, no, uh, but in terms of the, the process we are engaging in for a, a whole wider discussion about what our, the unarmed response program looks like, uh, where you really get into the, into the details about creating that program and, and the different values we should be employing, absolutely yes. So look out for that engagement, uh, you know, advertisement about that engagement process as we move uh, a little further into 2022. Thank you. And the next question is, what is the opportunity to create an extended timeline for community input in this process? Very few people would have known about the meetings this week and a one month time frame is not adequate for a community conversation. Given the ARPA deadline and extended, given the ARPA deadline and extended period of time over this decision making process should be feasible. So I'll just say we have less than five years to spend all this money, which means we need to get shovels in the ground and bids out and RFPs out as soon as possible because uh, in terms of uh, you know uh, government programs, five years is a very short period of time. Um, you know we're, we have uh, instructions from our council to bring back a final recommendation by March 1st. Uh, and that we're, we're really committed to sticking to that timeline. So I would encourage people to take advantage of the survey tools we have. Uh, you know, we have other uh, public engagement meetings that uh, we're undertaking this week and next week. Uh, when the final recommendation goes to council, they will be debating it, and I'm sure they will be amending it, and that will all happen in public forums at council meetings. You'll have opportunities to speak at public comment and to talk to your council members about it and make suggestions then too. So, uh, you know, we're uh, all told this the public uh, engagement portion of this ARP process is going to last about two plus months. Uh, we think that's a pretty good investment of time and, and we just encourage everybody to participate and encourage your friends to participate. There are a lot of opportunities to, uh, to speak to this and to make suggestions before Council adopts a final recommendation. Okay, the next question is, what alternative forms of funding support for these projects have been explored? Does the potential to support a project through other resources or other resource streams shape the ultimate priority it may be given? Marty, do you want to talk a little bit on that one? Uh, sure, I'd be happy to. Um, as part of each budget cycle, we look for opportunities to fund projects. Unfortunately, there are always more projects than we have available resources. Therefore, this one-time money from the American Rescue Plan provides us opportunities to do projects that we otherwise would not be able to fund. Okay. 
The next question is, would you envision the unarmed response unit interacting with the existing mental health crisis response program run by Washtenaw County? Uh, so the unarmed response or the, the, excuse me, the crisis response program that's run by Washtenaw County is, is going to exist. It will exist into the future. Uh, you know, the sheriff and um, uh, director Cortez at community mental health uh, have invested a lot of time and resources into it and are, I think, committed to continuing to make it better and better. And so, uh, you know, as our unarmed response program comes together, I think there is going to have to be some interaction with the program uh, at the county. Um, but what that interaction looks like uh, and, you know, how extensive it is or how independent the city program is, I think that all uh, uh, is to be determined. And we really have to, you know, go through our, our public process and have that conversation about, um, you know, how, how we want our program to look before we can come to that kind of final conclusion. Thank you. And I'm gonna jump out, jump over to hands being raised and then I'll get back to the written Q&A. So I see one hand raised. Carrie, you should be able to talk. Hi, uh, thank you for calling on me. Uh, my name is Carrie Rangans and I, um, my day job is to work for a local or for a state public health um, agency called the Michigan Public Health Institute where I'm contracted to the Department of Michigan Health and Human Services. And I work in the behavioral health area in the department. And mm -hmm. right now we're working on rolling out some um, statewide initiatives. One of them is to use a statewide crisis and access phone line. And um, this summer it will be coming to Washtenaw County and across the rest of the state. Right now it's being piloted, piloted in the um, Northern part of the state and um, Oakland County. And, that will also interface with the national 988 suicide hotline. And so I'm wondering how any local work that we're doing on unarmed crisis response can interface with that and how that's um, being planned right now. And for this particular proposal, how to make sure that we're bringing in folks to make sure that our local work is aligned with that statewide. Um, infrastructure that is going to also benefit our community. All right, thank you. I'll just, I'll just say quickly that um, it's, it all has to be part of the conversation as the program comes together. Uh, so, you know, it'll, it'll certainly be something that we consider as we talk about this uh, moving through the spring. Okay, moving back over to the Q&A, um, there is a request for Glenn, who spoke earlier, to make the survey result materials publicly available as part of the information informing the public during this engagement process. All right, um, the next question is, Chief Cox, can you explain more about the platform details? What will the platform increase the capacity to do more specifically, 1.2 million seems to be a very high price for a data platform. It will actually give the public direct access to data, but um, the things that we particularly track, uh, we currently don't have the ability to do that. Uh, it also it, it will potentially link and, and find uh, correlations between things that we do um, throughout all the many activities we have. And uh, it, it, it's, it provides just so much more trans, transparency that would currently exist. Uh, you know, we're actually able to, instead of keeping things in file cabinets, uh, you know, around certain uh, aspects of forms and things of that nature, we might be able to link all of this stuff together and actually, you know, produce and describe and, and, and publish, you know, correlations that we found as a result of being able to track uh, the data. But the, the number one important part about this is just the public's ability to actually um, give us input on what they're looking for and having direct access to some of this. Thank you. And on the topic of data collection, um, there's a question about what data is collected and what will be available to the public. So the data that we're making reference to really has to do with the um, the day-to-day -day activities of the police department. 
and and actually some of the areas where we probably don't even capture uh, data. And so it's really internal data to be able to share that with the public and and also seek out from them information that, that we might have or, or, or they might want us to capture uh, in, a, in a different way. Okay, and don't go anywhere. I have another data platform question. Where will would the data platform be housed? Who would have access, have input on its format and content? Would it be the police department, city council, ICPOC? Is there any sense of if how the data could be independently audited per best data management practice? Yeah, the data is, is not its own um, independent being, so to speak. It is bringing together all the different aspects of what we do and, and it captures uh, those activities and it actually gives us the, the ability to, to pull information from that so we can share it. So it's, it's not um, public data. It's probably a lot more internal data around the day-to-day -day activities of what we do. And it potentially can link all those different activities and give us the ability to analyze and, uh, and, and really report out on all the different things that we do and, and maybe see um, I know correlations that we currently can't do right now because we just don't have the ability to analyze it in that way. Okay, I thank think you. I answered that one, I think. Thank you. All right, the next question, this is from Lisa Jackson, Chair of the Independent Community Police Oversight Commission. There is no question that AAPD needs a new dashboard. The question is why AAPD is not using its own budget to pay for it. The system should have been purchased long ago why are ARPA funds now the appropriate source, especially given the numbers of police officers approved and accounted for in the budget, uh, but who have not been hired? I might um, just add a little bit on that and, and Marty and Chief Cox, you can feel free to, to add to what, uh, what I have to say, but you know, I hear that a lot that uh, you know, a specific department has its own budget or its own thing and, and that it's, you know, it's separate. Why, why doesn't parks pay for this? Why doesn't, you know, the police pay for that? Why doesn't, and the, the reality is, is that what we have is a combined city budget. We have a, a general fund, which funds all of our governmental activities, plus uh, a series of other uh, funds like utility fund, right? Or, or, you know, we have a parks millage fund or something like that. But for the most part, uh, our core kind of basic government operations are paid for out of the general fund. And when we put the budget together at the beginning of every year, we there's a it's a very long convoluted process, but we go to each department and say, what are your operational needs this year? And then we look at direction from city council to construct to estimate what our operational needs are this year. And and you know we kind of start at that baseline of what our needs are and then we assign the appropriate budget. And so, uh, you know, when it comes to kind of larger initiatives like this data platform, the software costs real money. You know, it's, it's not something off the shelf that, uh, you know, you can order on Amazon. It's a very specialized uh, type of program that handles this large amounts of data and helps you analyze them. So it is costly and it is above and beyond what the normal operating budget would be for the police department. Um, and so, you know, whether it's, general fund revenue or ARPA revenue or a state grant or whatever, all of that money gets plugged into our general fund. And we try to, we try to uh, just take our priorities as they come, take the revenue streams as they come and meet them with our priorities as they exist today. And so, uh, you know, I'll just say that about how our, how our budget works. You know, we're taking community feedback. If what we hear from the community is, you know, X, Y, or Z programs probably aren't a priority for ARPA funds, then you may not see that in the final recommendation. Uh, but, you know, these other programs are something the city should have thought of, and we'd like to see that included. You may see that in the final recommendation. And so the public input on, uh, on whether uh, any of these projects should be prioritized uh, with ARPA funds really is meaningful and it really does matter. And, and we would encourage people to give us that kind of input. I see that Dr. Jackson has her hand up, so I'm going to allow you to talk. There you go. You should be able to talk. Thank you so much. And thank you, John, for explaining the budget process. 
And I would encourage anybody listening to pay attention to the city council meetings where uh, people present their proposals for their pieces of the general fund. Um, but the question still stands and, and hasn't wasn't answered in that way. Um, you know, I, I'm well aware of 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 the as as the chair of the police oversight commission, well aware of the need for the dashboard and have had conversations about um, types of dashboards that might be appropriate. Um, but the question is really for the chief about why ARPA funds now would be the appropriate source for that. And um, my point about the funds used for the general fund vis-a-vis -vis numbers of officers who are not here retiring, have retired, et cetera, is a, is a valid one. Um, and so I guess my question is um, it, what I originally asked, which is why now um, ARPA funds for, uh, for this expenditure that, you know, I think by we could all say was needed years ago. And I understand waiting for a data analyst to make a call about which one, but given that even, you know, six, eight months ago, why ARPA funds, why now? Thank you. Yeah, well, I, you know, I, my two cents on this is if you have a need, it's about filling that need. And uh, if this is an opportunity to fill the need and, 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 and actually a vehicle to do that, then then I think this is actually an excellent time to do it where uh, it's not um, you know, costing taxpayers uh, additional money that uh, was unforeseen. You know? and, and so uh, that's how I would look for it. We have a lot of needs in general. It's about priorities and, and timing. And sometimes you have needs, but you know that there's no funding for it. And so you wait for an opportune time to really push uh, the envelope on, on you know, taking care of a bigger budget uh, concern. So that is my uh, brief explanation on it. Okay, thanks. I'm going to jump over to some written Q&A now. So this next question is, research and organizers on the ground invested in community safety models have shown that unarmed responses not tied to law enforcement are much more effective at preventing violence and creating care-based safety than community policing or co-response with police or law enforcement. If the city is employing a community-driven research-based approach, will the city be dismissing this research to dedicate funds towards a community policing model a co-response model or another solution that expands local law enforcement efforts? I think that's a, a pretty wide philosophical question, Donnell, that I'm not sure we're gonna be able to answer in this meeting. Uh, and, you know, we're, I think everybody on this, uh, in this meeting knows that uh, approaches to law enforcement are uh, undergoing a sea change in this country. And that is a, a very, very wide ranging conversation that we are having in the community and we're gonna continue to have it. And, uh, and I think that to do that conversation justice, uh, you know, we need to be in a, uh, in a setting where, uh, you know, we have a wider range of city decision makers here who can participate and, and community members and stakeholders to participate. But you've definitely hit the nail on the head and, and I wanna thank you for the comment. Thank you. This next question is, I'm concerned that people who would most benefit from the unarmed response team will not be able to give feedback. Will you be reaching out to our citizens who might not have electronic ability to Zoom uh, with people who would most benefit from unarmed response team? So when we do the public engagement process for unarmed response, we will be uh, you know, probably most of those meetings will be virtual, um, but I think depending on the state of the pandemic, we would like to try to do some in-person meetings uh, or at least one in-person meeting. But, uh, you know, we've all been uh, been forced into this virtual world by the pandemic and we're, we're all just kind of living in that place right now. So, but that is, you know, uh, finding ways to reach parts of the community uh, who don't normally see city notices about uh, public meetings and who don't normally participate in our public meetings is definitely top of mind for us. Uh, and it's that's actually been a topic of conversation among city staff just this week uh, as the as the public engagement process for unarmed responses uh, is coming together. So I appreciate that comment and, and uh, it very much reflects uh, what we're trying to do in City Hall. Thank you. 
And then this was um, a response from Glenn. Anyone who wants a copy of the survey framework should send me a message at G Nelson AA. So that's G N E L S O N A A at gmail.com. Um, so uh, I'm going to put that in there. People should be able to read that. Um, and Glenn, I think you can probably put a link into the Q&A feature that we can post up there. So um, if you want to try doing that, um, people should be able to see. OK. Um, so here's some more budgeting questions. So exactly what is um, Ann Arbor Police Department spending its $31 million budget on if we can't buy its own software? So like most budgets, um, the pred predominantly most of our budget probably goes to salaries, uh, you know, and, and, and probably other benefits. But you know what? I, I, I will refer to the finance person to actually explain that better because that's a little bit out of my, my, my role and realm. <laughs> you did a fine job, Chief. Um, yes, actually, the police department's budget is obviously mostly comprised of salaries and wages and benefits, um, including pensions and retirement costs, as well as cost for the vehicles that they utilize. Um, so obviously the police department has a significant fleet, which um, takes up a good majority of their budgets. They're also supplemented with um, IT costs, in addition to you, you know general materials and supplies type of issues. Um, and so on the topic of costs, what are ongoing costs likely, likely to be for data project and creation of reports, cost and software? I would say that I, I don't I don't know if there would be very much ongoing. Um, it, once it's purchased, uh, that cost will be over with and um, and the personnel that we have is already here. So I, I don't necessarily know if there will be much more additional cost after being purchased. All right, and the next question is, if Ann Arbor establishes its own crisis response number, who would be eligible to get services by accessing it? For example, those who live within the city limits, those who work within the city limits, those who live within Ann Arbor School District, uh, those with Ann Arbor and their postal address? Um, an excellent question. I, you know, uh, I don't want to, again, I keep saying this and I'm sorry to keep saying this. I don't want to get too prescriptive about it, but I would imagine that if this is a program that is solely being funded by the city of Ann Arbor, it would service any uh, request for service that originated within the city of Ann Arbor. Um, but you know, I'll give you a big caveat that there's a lot of work to be done on this program. And uh, I think that before we uh, really uh, settle in on answers like that, we have a lot of work to do, a lot of engagement work, a lot of policy work to do before we get there. Thank you. And then this uh, last one is a comment. Despite the pandemic, Washington commissioners have had listening session sessions on how to spend the ARPA funds. This was before the Omicron variant. All right. And that's all that's been typed in for the time being. But if other people have questions, we do encourage you to ask them now. You can either raise your hand or type in in the Q&A feature. All right, well, we'll, we'll wait, I'm waiting for that. I'm gonna try my hand at sharing my screen again and hopefully this works out um, well, because uh, I would like to talk about next steps. So hopefully this looks a little bit better. Can everybody see that okay? Okay, so this is the page that I wanted to go over about next steps. Um, 
So here we are, this is the process so far. So what's happened so far is that projects were identified uh, based on the criteria that was set forth that we talked about a little bit earlier. So staff um, began identifying projects that fit the federal criteria and that could be done within 2026. Since then, um, over the past month or so, um, those projects have been refined and shared with the community. So we do have a series of videos. If you haven't seen those already, those are on the project website. And so those give a little two to three minute synopsis of each project that's being considered. Uh, we do encourage you to, to go look at those. And now we are holding the community conversations. So these conversations, um, as you know, are really just to get a sense of what the projects are. And we're having a whole series of these. It's kicked off last night with an overview of all the projects and this um, meeting as well as uh, other, we have two other meetings today, and then several meetings next week are meant to be a deeper dive into each of the projects so people can have time to ask questions. So these first three steps are really about education so and having these conversations and getting a sense of what the ARPA funds are, what they can be sent, spent on, what um, is being considered. And this is your opportunity. If you do want to provide suggestions, we don't have a formal form or anything like that to fill out, but you are welcome to submit suggestions. Those will be viewed and weighed against the criteria. Again, everything needs to fit the criteria and be considered. And from there, we will be holding a survey. So there is a survey that will be going out to everybody um, to help get a sense of where people would want the money to be spent. So basically the question that's going to be asked is where would you spend the money? Um, and so we'll be collecting those uh, surveys throughout uh, the end of January, February, and that will all go to city council. So all the feedback that we're receiving will go to city council in March and decisions will be made about where the ARPA funding will be allocated. And then from there, the projects will start to be um, implemented and they'll be follow, you know, ensuing public engagement processes with each of the funded projects after that. And each of the projects, as mentioned before, um, are slated to be done by 2026. And I see that we have another question that came up. Oh, several more questions. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing and get back to the questions. I asked the question earlier about aligning with the statewide infrastructure rolling out. I'd be happy to talk more with city staff or others on this call about that. All right, and that's from Carrie. Okay. Um, and then another question is, forgive me if this has been covered. I arrived after the session began. Can we have access to the slides that are being shared? Yes, you can. We are gonna post everything up on um, the project website and I'll, I'll post that up uh, again a little bit later so you can see where that address is. We're also recording all of the meetings so you should be able to see those on the project website as well. All right. Um, and then this is a, a comment from Kevin. I'd be happy to work with Chief Cox and our Police Department, ICBOC City Administrator, if there's a perceived need to map out the larger funding landscape for police data dashboard and transparency projects. And then here is a question. Am I right that data will be entirely internal to the Ann Arbor Police Department, not public, except for except as the department analysis analyzes it? And I, I can't say entirely it, it would all be public facing, but the fact is we are trying to um, interact with the public and give them input as well as our own internal things. So uh, if the public um, who currently doesn't have the ability to, to reach out to us in different ways or give the input. Um, if the you know if we're able to track that data as well, we probably would be transparent about it. But uh, as of now, um, I would say the answer is that this is mostly about our internal day-to-day -day operations and how do we do it outside of nine one one because the dispatch data is uh, is is the counties and um, they own that data. So you know this is what I would say today. Thank you. And then we do have a question. What languages will the survey be available in and will there be a paper survey? Uh, yes, there will definitely be a paper survey in addition to an online survey. The languages that we um, had for 
that we, we've um, learned that are, that are most pressing that we need in this community are Chinese, Spanish, and Russian. And so we had um, some interpretation done for the announcement about these meetings and hope to do that with a survey as well and hopefully expand the languages. So yes, we do um, hope to have the survey in several languages. We're gonna have to tinker with that with the online platform. There might be some limitations to that, but um, we do hope to do that. Any other questions? I don't see any hands raised. Don't know, go ahead. Just a quick follow up to uh, Chief Cox's comment that the call data for 911 belongs to the county. Um, it sounds like this might be um, another opportunity to get um, some influence over that uh, data and tie it into an armed response which would mean to allow for the city to do its own dispatch, which would uh, give the chief access to the data since he just said he doesn't have access to it. And it would also solve our problem of how we would accomplish um, the dispatching, uh, dispatching issue uh, with unarmed response inside the city of Ann Arbor. So uh, not so much a question, but maybe just a comment um, reflecting on some of the challenges with the data um, that both the chief has and needs, as well as an opportunity to tie it into what we're trying to accomplish with unarmed response. Okay, and one more comment question that came in to clarify ICPOC will ask council to make sure that we have access to data that are not public facing as part of the best practices and oversight and transparency, just as we do now. Transparency is a tenant of this proposal and the oversight commission needs full unfettered access to data. Okay, I don't see any other questions coming in or hands raised. So again, I will uh, do my best at sharing my screen um, to show you some final information about this process. Um, hopefully you can all see that. Um, so the upcoming meetings today, obviously we're in the um, afternoon meeting about community law enforcement and public safety data platform. Tonight, there is a meeting about the galvanized water service line replacement. On Wednesday, January 19th, we'll be um, focusing on housing for homeless households and property acquisition for affordable housing. Um, uh, that afternoon, there'll be the fire station, the net zero fire station that's being proposed along with solar on city facilities. And then that evening at six, the city clerk election uh, center. And then on Thursday, January 20th at noon, there's the Gallup Park Bridge uh, road and trail renovation. And then that afternoon is the Universal Basic Income and Coordinated Funding Support Projects. So more information about all of this is at a2gov.org rescue funds. Um, you'll be able to find the recordings there at the site, um, any information that we're posting about this project. Um, and you can also find my email and uh, Kayla Coleman's email. If you do want to uh, send us an email, you're more than welcome to. And there's also a phone number on that site. Um, so I'll just leave this up here for the moment so you can see that link to the project website. And then I'll see, I'm not seeing any other questions coming in. Our hands raised. All right, so I guess we'll stick around a little bit longer just in case anything comes to anybody. And again, I'll just leave this slide up here so people can um, write down if they wanna to come to any future meetings or if you wanna uh, write down the, the address to the project site.
Okay, well, wonderful. We really appreciate everybody coming. Again, we'll stick around for a few minutes longer. You know, this was um, intended to go to 530, so we can certainly stick around a little bit longer. Um, if any questions come to you, please feel free to ask them. We have a thank you. Thank you. I always appreciate it. Thank you. Several thank yous coming in. We really appreciate it. Um, we do have a question. We know that there is an unarmed response separate from any kind of armed enforcement proposed by uh, CROS. How is an unarmed response program unarmed if it is dispatched by the sheriff's office? I suppose an unarmed response program is unarmed if the people who show up don't have arms on them. You know, um, and I don't mean to be facetious when I say that, but uh, to an extent, a program like this will have to have some coordination with 911. And I want to point to a, a comment that uh, was made earlier, which was an excellent comment, that there are a lot of people who simply will not call 911 when they need emergency services. And that is absolutely true. There are also people in the community who the first number they think of will be 911. And they may not need a police officer, but because of years of uh, training about how the 911 program works, that you should always call 911 when there's emergency or, or something like that. There are a lot of people in the community who will call 911 first when, when they know when they're making that call, they're gonna, they're gonna, you know, when the dispatcher picks up, they're gonna say, I don't need a police officer, but I do need X service. And so, um, that's something I would encourage people to keep in mind too, that just as much as it is true that we may not be providing uh, the most beneficial program if we're only routing people through 911, it is also true that we're not gonna be creating the most beneficial program if we are completely separate from 911. And so, uh, you know, there's gonna be a lot of time to discuss this in the community. And, and like I said, we're gonna have a very deliberate uh, engagement uh, opportunities and and we're going to try to put together the most thoughtful and, and comprehensive program that we can. But that's something that I'd like people to consider and think about uh, as we're moving through the discussion about what the unarmed response program is going to look like. And then there is a, a question. Uh, Sheriff Clayton and Chief Cox said they won't ever send their people out without guns. Will there be new unarmed police maybe? I don't know that I can answer that. Um, I'm sorry, what, could you repeat that one more time? I'm sorry. Sure. Um, sorry, let me scroll back down to it. Uh, basically, the question is, that will the renew unarmed police? Um, uh, yeah, will there be new armed police as part of the force? New armed police. Unarmed police. We do have civilian staff that are uh, that are unarmed currently, and particularly in community engagement and things of that nature. So, um, we currently do have people with the police department that are not armed. Hopefully, that answers it. I'm sorry. And yeah, I'm, I think they're wondering if if more would be added through this program. Um. No, not, not, not that I'm aware of, no. I think part of the intention of an unarmed response program is to have people who are human services professionals or behavioral health professionals uh, showing up to calls uh, in instances where that's appropriate and where an armed police officer may not be appropriate. And I think that really is the intention behind the program. And so um, uh, I think, you know, like I said, a lot of discussion to happen in the community as this program comes together, but I think that's the intention uh, that we're keeping at heart as we move forward. In my silence, is, it was really about uh, this was a charge from city council to someone else and not a police solution. So that's why I didn't want to give out a police solution. <laughs> right. Thank you, Chief.
Thank you. Okay, there's no more questions at this moment. Thank you. Okay, well, if there's no more questions, I think I'll put that slide back up again. Um, and then we can probably give it another five minutes or so. And if no other questions come up again, then we can probably bring this to a conclusion. We'd like to thank everybody for taking this time to have these conversations with us. Um, this is an important effort. You know, this is big money that, you know, we want to make sure we direct in the most useful places in the community. Um, so we do appreciate you coming to talk to us about these and helping learn about the, the projects as well. All right. Well, there's a question about how many people attended today. Um, let's see, um, I can pull that up in just a moment. Right now we have um, 13 participants on the line. There were a few more earlier. I don't have the exact number, but it was somewhere between 13 and 20 people. And last and yesterday we had about 50 people that came to the meeting. So we'll give this to about 10 after, and if there's no further questions, then we'll draw the webinar to a close. But in the meantime, if something comes to you, feel free to post it or raise your hand.
Okay, well, it's 10 after now, and uh, there's no more questions. Uh, so I think we're going to bring this to a close. Again, thank you everyone for attending. Please help us spread the word about the upcoming meetings. We do want continued participation in this. Um, and then uh, certainly, oh, I do want to mention on the website that's listed there, there is an opportunity to sign up for um, uh, receiving information about this process process. So um, please um, go to the website and submit your email to that so you can keep up to date. Um, we will also be sending out um, information with, with the emails that we already have. Um, so again, thank you, everyone. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to carrying on this conversation with you.